I wanted to make a video to talk a little bit about the uh, bench test setup we have for our Nissan Leaf motor and inverter. Um, we haven't quite selected which battery and battery management system we're going to go with yet. We'd, we'd originally thought that we were going to go with a full Nissan Leaf battery and, and everything, a full Nissan Leaf system, but we're having trouble locating a Nissan Leaf battery pack and even the ones I do find, I'm not really happy with the amount of life left in them. So we're still trying to figure that out. And while we're waiting, um, I was looking for ways that I could come up with the high voltages that the Nissan Leaf motor requires um, to do some testing at home and start getting more familiar with the motor and what we're going to need to communicate with it and, c and control it and get feedback from it and all those sort of things. And um, so what I came up with uh, to get those high voltages that we need, um, the company Greenworks, and there's a few other companies like Cobalt, a few other ones that, that have these, but some of the lawn equipment out there, electric lawn equipment, is starting to move to 80-volt batteries. They've had 40-volt batteries for a while, but these 80-volt battery packs are now starting to become available and be affordable. Um, and so what I decided I would do is put three of them in series, which is not quite the leaf battery voltage, but it's enough that we can do some basic testing. Probably would need four to get up to like 320 volts, but for now, we're going to use, you know, with this three in series, it gives us about 240 or 250 volts. Um... So that was uh, one of the things that I came up with, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but in making a bench test setup, I wanted to make sure that um, our setup didn't wind up maybe looking like what some of the other folks online have done. Now, not to, not to, I don't want to sound like I'm putting down other folks that have put information out on YouTube. I'm certainly appreciative of anything people are doing out there. But what what I wanted to do and show my son, um, you know, when I do work uh, with NASA, we're in a very much a safety first culture. Um, and when I'm dealing with high voltages, like 240 and 250 volts, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that the consequences of a failure at those voltages is much higher, right? So, um, so that was one of my guiding principles about what I wanted to set up. I didn't want um, uh, I, I didn't want a failure like a cable slipping off of something, or us making a mental mistake, or you know, the motor vibrating something and something falling off a table. One of those things happening, and you start throwing 250 volts around DC, um, can have serious consequences. So that was the first thing it was a safety concern the second is that you're dealing with expensive equipment so that's another reason why i did not want a test rig with very loose temporary connections exposed metal everywhere things like that so with those principles in mind and given the fact that we were waiting on a number of things i started designing how we wanted to do our bench testing and um, i'll walk you through some of that here so on the motor side um well one of the things that Charlie learned is that there's actually a gap but in the inverter uh, between the um, prongs and the housing. So we made sure to cover that up with electrical tape um, because you can drop a washer right down that gap and it'll go into the inverter. So I'm just throwing that out there for anybody else that does testing. But So we've got our high voltage leads going there. Again, we're just going to be drawing a minimal amount of current, so I'm not too worried um, about, you know, putting super beefy wires uh, for right now. Um, there's a couple of other leads there that are for the voltmeter. So for everything we're doing, um, I went ahead and set up some voltmeters. So I've got one for 12 volts. This is the battery voltage. And then this is the voltage at the inverter, which were those leads you saw just now. So we'll take a look more of that in a second. Um, and then coming back around here, um, we've uh, I've used some of the... Um, Wigo connectors to try to for places that were just more temporary. I've got my little CAN bus uh, spy uh, device there, and uh, try to keep some of these plugs as manageable as possible. We made a a wire harness to go from the big plug on the inverter down to the motor. Got that all soldered. Um, on the battery packs, um, there's a guy on YouTube who sells these 3D printed connectors to go into these uh, 80 volt batteries. 
and um, <laughs> they're great. Um, they're maybe a little bit priced too high for what um, I'm doing, but I went ahead and bought three of them to support the guy. Also put, you know, made sure we, we got good solid connections and we um, sealed everything with uh, shrink wrap. Um, you know, we've got wires wrapped with strain relief on things. Um, I've got an e-stop switch up here with a key. So um, even if we had things hooked up temporarily, we go inside to eat lunch. If somewhere were to come out here and, um, you know, try to turn something on, we take the key out when we're not using it. Um, <clears throat> so looking a little bit closer. So this is what I'm using for my 12-volt supply right now. Just a little desktop uh, bench power supply, actually, that I got at a garage sale. Um, I've got a couple of buses here, one for all my grounds, one for all my 12 volts. Um, the main, like, ignition switch is here on off. This is our forward, neutral, and reverse. And then um, you can see the wiring for the Thunderstruck. They, they have some pretty good instructions on how to wire everything up. And again, those are those three voltage meters. Here's the contactor. Um... I wanted to make sure that the leads, since there's high voltage there at the leads on the contactor, um, I wanted to make really sure that not only could the anything from those leads not touch the low voltage side, the 12 volt side turning it on, but I didn't want anyone to accidentally be able to touch it with anything, so I 3D printed some caps and some nuts to make sure those were safe. We've got a little battery disconnect cable that we that we disconnect whenever we're not using stuff. There's the relay for the... Um, pre-charge resistor, which is down there at the bottom. Um, and then we have our relay box. Uh, right now we have a few relays for reverse lights and brake lights. And I've also got one to turn for the inverter power. I think I may use the same relay to power the, um, to power the cooling pump that I haven't hooked up yet, but I may add another relay. And those are all fuse protected there. And then I've got my main 12 volt power bus and negative power bus. Um, and then we have a little Raspberry Pi back there that's running so that we can run the Thunderstruck VCU serial port config via PuTTY or we can run various CAN software with this uh, CAN sniffing device. So so anyway, this is our um, the hardware side of things. The other thing that I'm, you know, like I mentioned, it's one thing you can have all the hardware set up right, but it make a minimal mistake. So everything that Charlie and I do we have a power up checklist and a power down checklist. We don't do anything out of order on the checklist. Um, we, Whenever we're messing with wires and connections, these are not safety rubber gloves. I know that that's not you know, what is made for high voltage, but it's better than nothing and still gives us good dexterity. So when we're messing around with wires, we throw on some cheap rubber gloves just to help in case uh, we should accidentally touch something. But again, those instructions, you know, as we go through and we change any part of our sequence or we find something potentially dangerous or that could be done out of order, we write it down, we change our checklist. Um, for example, uh, you know, the leads on this, on this power supply have a red and a black. Um, but the, the um, I'm just going to go ahead and turn that off. The, the screws for them come actually all the way off. So it's possible to swap the red and the black. So our instructions say, don't look at that. Our instructions say, look at the markings on the power supply, the positive and negative there, just to avoid the case that someone may have switched these screw terminals. Little things like that, as you discover, you know, you write it down and you make sure that you don't make that mistake. Um, so I'll go ahead and power it up. Um, I, I've already walked through most of the checklist and got all of our little connections made and everything. Um, <clears throat> so that's why you're seeing that there is a battery voltage there. As you can see, we're around 250 volts. Um, if I turn on the uh, main ignition switch, you'll hear the pre-charge resistor, and then you'll hear the contactor click. Um, you'll see that we're getting some CAN data. And the other thing you'll notice is now we have inverter voltage. So once that contactor clicks on, um, or actually once the pre-charge starts filling it up, you'll see that inverter voltage go. Uh, and these, these meters are not only useful for troubleshooting, but when we're powering down or, or even powering up and we want, we have steps in here 
make sure those this voltage is zero make sure that you know there are certain steps where even once you turn something on we're not expecting voltage yet we double check that those are zero um yeah so you know and and that allows us to test things like here's our little uh brake switch that i wired in so when you hit that we see our brakes go on and off um, once we start testing the region uh, there, you know, the, the region command from the Thunderstrike VCU should also turn on the brakes, so we'll be able to test that. Um, here is our forward, neutral, and reverse switch. So when that's in reverse, we see that a reverse light comes on. Um, another thing that we wanted to make sure was secure, based on, you know, the, the great videos other people have put out, is the pedal. So we have a really sort of firm, I, I 3D printed a mount, and we attached it to some wood. So... Um, if we move this into forward and then as we're testing this just makes sure that you know somebody trying to push this pedal down with their hands and it's on a table and sliding around or something that doesn't happen so we can do that and then we'll see we get some motion which is really great I'll put that back into neutral um, so anyway yeah that you know we 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 are having good success with our benchtop setup and i wanted to kind of just walk through it for anyone else that's thinking about building one of these um again think about those two guiding principles you have a high dc voltage that's worth a little bit extra margin of safety than the 12 volts that you're normally dealing with on a car and you're dealing with really expensive equipment you know if you get a short and you mess up that inverter that you just paid a lot of money for or the motor or something else um, or that even that thunderstruck VCU which, you know those aren't cheap either so pay attention use a checklist when you make connections take time to you know crimp on a solid connector put on heat shrink um, don't necessarily just uh, you know clip things with alligator clips and stuff like that uh, unless unless it's warranted you know what I mean there's sometimes you're doing a temporary connection and that's warranted but um, if you know you're going to be setting up a benchtop test and doing it for a while and there's, there's uh, safety things at play, uh, you know, take a little extra time to do it safely. So anyway, um, wanted to get this video out there in case other folks, it can help someone or maybe you see something that we should be doing differently or suggestions. Uh, we'd certainly love to see that in the comments. So thanks for uh, following us in our, uh, in our journey.